Another one in the books. The Yankees have taken five consecutive series to start the 2023 season. Uh, or actually, they've they've gone without a series loss in the first five series of the year because they split against the Minnesota Twins at home at Yankee Stadium this past weekend. Um, and it was impressive to, to, you know, drop the first two games um, and then battle back to take the next two and earn the split because with the way they lost, the way they lost the first two games, you know, on Thursday you got the laugher from the, the very first inning. And then on Friday you, you get the heartbreaker in the late innings. So to be able to bounce back like they did and salvage a split, still going five consecutive series now without a loss, a series loss, that's very good. Um, the Yanks are actually, I heard this stat on a podcast, 8-0 and on the year in games that decide the series. So that's another positive to look at going forward. So let's talk about this series. Yankees Twins split it 2-2. We'll get into it. BD4 episode 509. Welcome to BD4, an RJ Carbone podcast. BD4, where there is no better way to get your Yankees and Knicks analysis. We also do MMA. Yanks every series, Knicks every game, MMA on occasion. BD4 is a five-star show on Apple Podcasts, also available in video format on YouTube and Spotify. So thanks for stopping by, and we hope you enjoy the show. Champion of the world, turning, looking, see ya! Anthony for three, bang! That one goes down! creates and shows some dexterity as well with the left hand. Oh, 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 oh. All right, let's talk about it. Episode 509 of the podcast. I'm your host, RJ Carbone. You are listening to BD4, another episode of the podcast. So the Yankees took the, they split. The series 2-2 this weekend against the Minnesota Twins. Who came into this one without Joey Gallo. Uh, due to an injury that we call Yankee Stadium-itis. Um, but the Yankees were at full health until the end there. <laughs> Talk about the Stanton thing. But the Yankees win. Uh, I keep saying they win. They t- they. Sp- they split the series 2-2 after losing the first two games. Um, so we'll talk about game one right now. Let's just, we might as well get right into it. Um, this was, oh, you know what, we're just going to run through this loss because <laughs> there's no point in talking about this one. There's nothing to discuss. The Yankees had a terrible game. Um, they lose 11-2. to Johnny Brito against Ryan. Uh, Brito had a nightmare start. The Twins dropped nine runs, I think it was, in the first inning. It was 9 nothing in the top of the first inning. So the game was over right there. Um, who cares? Rizzo hit a couple of you know, home runs that nobody's going to remember. Uh, but Johnny Brito was horrific. Horrific. Um, his fastball was flat. Right in the middle of the zone. Uh, some people think he was tipping his pitches because that's always something people think of when somebody gets shelled like they did, like he did. Could have been. I don't know. I think he was just flat. Um, going forward, how how he's obviously going to remain in the rotation because of the injuries, but how does he respond? I think the next start is, is obviously his biggest the biggest start of his career. Um, he could either he could either respond well and make it three of four starts in the year have been solid, or he could drop another dud and now be looking at too good, too bad, with the too bad on the latter half of that portion trending in a bad direction. 
Um, so it's going to be a big one for him this series, uh, upcoming series against the Angels. I think he's due to pitch Wednesday. Um, after Johnny Brito, it was, you know, Colton Brewer was actually DFA'd after the game. Uh, it was Hamilton who struck out six. Uh, then you had Cordero. Uh, and then after that, you had IKF come in. IKF threw a scoreless inning. We saw the EFIS pitch. Comes off the mound, and, and you saw him asking uh, home plate umpire to check him for substances. That was probably the best part of the night. Hey, the one thing I did like about this game, uh, before we move on to game two, was um, the pitch clock. I know I am literally the only baseball fan left who doesn't mind having to be patient. But this was the one game where I did not mind Manfred's little pitch clock. um, Because it just, uh, get it out of the way in in two hours and whatever it was. Um, But the Yankees, they they dropped the first game 11-2. And again, like I said, the second game was kind of the opposite way to lose. Uh, This one was just a... Whoops, wrong one. This one was just a complete heartbreaker. It it sucked because they were supposed to win this game. They did everything they needed to at the time, and they lose. Uh, The Yankees lost this one 4-3. You had Nestor going up against Varland. Bottom of the first, you get Volpe and Judge going back-to-back with home runs. Volpe's first career home run. It's 2-0 Yankees. No score until the top of the sixth. Correa goes deep off Nestor. It's 2-1. to one. Bottom of the sixth, Stanton hits a home run. 3-1 to one Yankees. And then the top of the seventh, Nestor allows another home run to forget who it was. It was some random. And it makes it 3-2 Yankees. Top of the eighth, that's when you got the big blow. Correa doubles. All of a sudden, it's 4-3 to three Minnesota. And the Yankees eventually lose. Um, in this game, the bats were pretty quiet again. And uh, they were the main reason for the loss. I'll say that. Uh, Stanton and Oswaldo had two hits. Stanton, Volpe, and Judge each each had a solo home run. Volpe was on base twice, had his first major league home run. Uh, John Sterling's call. Something about Volpe being a young fox. But in Italian, um, I I think it's, I don't know if I should even say controversial because from what I'm seeing over the internet, uh, a lot of people don't like the call. Um, I don't know. I don't really care about that stuff. Uh, I thought it was whatever. Um, The Yankees, you know, everyone else really pretty quiet on the night. Yankees struck out. Excuse me. The Yankees struck out 11 times. They walked only once. <clears throat> they had eight hits only <clears throat> at a 235 average on the day. <clears throat> um, only one opportunity with runners in scoring position, and they were 0 for 1. And uh, they had a double play they hit into. Can't expect to win a game and not even get into scoring position. You know, it was a very Yankees type loss where they just relied on simply the home run. Three solo shots in this game, and that was all. Uh, The bottom of the ninth was also pretty tough. You had a little bit of hope with, uh, was it Franchi Cordero, the base hit? And then Oswaldo immediately hits into the double play. Um, But you just, you can't score three runs against lackluster pitching and expect to win the game. So, um, the offense was definitely the main reason for the loss but also I I didn't like um, Aaron Boone just once again trying to get too cute Um, the first on two instances uh, the first time in this game in the eighth inning where he goes to Clay Holmes in the in the post game Boone said he one of the righty righty against Minnesota's best right handed hitters. But you literally had Ron Marinaccio, a righty, warming up and then you sat him down. I'm just sitting here, you know, why why randomly on a Friday night in April 
the 14th game of the season, decide to suddenly, out of nowhere, switch your closer's roll-up. That, to me, messes... I mean, that, that that's like no shit he's going to flop. Pitchers are a creature of habit. You always hear that. You know, I love having a role. That's my big thing. Guys need to know their roles. And their routine is the one thing that, in my opinion, you shouldn't mess with. Especially in a one-run game. To me, there was just no reason to get fancy there and do something different from the norm. But I know April is what the Yankees use as extended spring training, quote-unquote. But, yeah, I mean, you have all your top guns rested and ready coming into this game. Peralta, King, Marinaccio, whatever. You got ground ball guys in there, righty-righty guys in there, guys who get anybody out. You had them right there. But no, let's let's just get random and go Clay Holmes, not in the ninth, but in the eighth. And he blows it. He blows it. Um, and then you had the instance in the bottom of the ninth inning, an inning later, where you're going with Calhoun over DJ LeMayhew there in the ninth inning. I don't I don't know. You're telling me a guy who wasn't good enough to be a Yankee until just recently can now all of a sudden bat fifth there? With two outs in the bottom of the ninth inning. So you're telling me. Because Calhoun's batting from the left side. You trust your little lefty on righty thing so much. To where. You'd elevate that. Over going with the pure hitting DJ LeMayhew. DJ's on the scene because he can hit. That's his major league skill set. That's his strength. In this league. His biggest strength is he's a contact hitter. That's what he does. He's got damn near 16,000 hits in his career. But you trust Willie Calhoun over DJ LeMayu. That's what you're telling me. Um, and this is this is like the second time he made that same mistake where he... You know, I remember a few weeks ago. I forget who it was. Might have been the Phillies game. I don't remember. But he had Rizzo in the dugout waiting for him to pinch hit over Hicks. But there's two out and he lets and he lets Donaldson end the game. It's the same thing. You had DJ with the bat in case Calhoun got on base. But it's like it's it's one of those things you gotta get there first. And they and they worried about trying to steal an at bat there. So that that bothered me. Um but that all said, okay, I'm not gonna sit here and act like Aaron Boone wholeheartedly lost the game. Um, Because at the end of the day, Clay Holmes just isn't a very good pitcher anymore. You know, he's also got... There's also going to be 50% on Boone, but also 50% on Clay Holmes. That's the way I'm looking at it. He had his little run where he dipped his ERA to like a quarter of a run back in the early season last year. But since then, he's been horrendous. He's walking batters, hitting batters, putting traffic on the bases constantly, and not being able to get the job done consistently enough. He still looks like he's missing high, and, and that's a problem. It's the same shit with his mechanics, the release point. Um, I don't know. I don't. It, the sinker seems like it's ineffective to lefties uh because they they kind of just go with it since it's you know it, it's something that runs arm side and the only other pitch he throws is the slider slider sweeper wherever the fuck you want to call it they're the same pitch it's just with more horizontal movement but and that slider is you know it, it moves there's no he doesn't throw anything straight he doesn't have the four seam basketball he doesn't throw his four seam i think that's why he struggles sometimes to constantly hit the zone. Because everything moves. The sinker especially has been out of the zone a lot this season. I think that's the that that's the pitch that has uh, walked all these batters. And hit these batters. It's, it's physical and it's also mental. You know, physical shit aside. I just don't think Clay Holmes is built mentally to be the closer. You know, you hear... You hear a lot... Uh, yeah. You know, you hear this this whole th- quote where, where people are always saying Yankees fans have been so used to Mariano since he's retired. They've been spoiled in a sense. I, I get that. 
But I also think it's kind of an excuse to settle for mediocrity. Um, and I'll say it again, Clay Holmes, in, I have it down here in my notes, in 31 innings since July 12th of last season, he has an ERA just south of 6. That's bad. Um, I just don't think he's mentally got it. He seems like he gets flustered easily. I think he's feeble. I think he's mentally weak, soft, too small for the moment. And I'm not trying to be an asshole. Um, but I'm just saying that's not the mentality you want from your closer. You know, it's much like Araldis Chapman, where Clay crumbles in the big spots. If Chapman didn't have his four seamer, he was toast a lot of the time. You know, there were moments where you could rely on the slider. He tried throwing that splitter, but it wasn't consistent. If Holmes doesn't have his sinker and his mechanics are off, as we've seen the last two nights and plus the first outing of the year too, he's also toast. So I'm kind of done with him at closer. I'm kind of ready to move on from him. Uh, I think the sample size has been large enough to where you got to go with somebody more reliable. Um, the good thing is I, I don't think you have to make any big trade for a closer. Uh, I don't think it's an issue to where you have to look outside the house. You can go in-house here. We've got guys. The Yankee relieving core, even with the injury hits, we've got guys who can step up right now and be the closer. You want a ground ball guy? you got King. You want a guy who just gets outs and is maybe the most reliable pitcher on the staff the last two years? you got Wandy Peralta, who's probably the favorite. You want to give Marinaccio a bigger role? I've been pro Marinaccio since the guy came up last season. He does his job. He's quiet, doesn't say much, he's composed, and he gets the job done. Why not? You got those three guys. Pick pick either one of them. Uh, people want Loisaga. He's currently on the DL, and I don't know if I want him closing, but you got guys. You got guys. And, and I just think at this point it's been a large enough sample to where don't let this get to a Chapman situation where you stick with it too long and, and it ends up costing you some games. Because remember, while the Yankees have a solid shot and are probably favorite to win the division, um, home field to me is still important. And you got to win the division first. So uh, every game is important. April, September, October, uh, June, July. Every game is just as important. I don't want you losing games that you should have won like on Friday night because your closer can't get it done even if he has to slide down. So while Boom was at fault, the other half of me says, yeah, but Holmes has to do his shit, has to do his job. Um, the positive of that game was that Nesta Cortez was the lone bright spot on the mound. Seven innings for Nestor. Only two runs scored. Five hits, no walks. Um, and he struck out seven. 93 pitches and got the no decision. He looked great out there. Definitely his best outing of the season. Gave the Yankees length. He got his soft contact. Kept the Twins off balance all night. Had a great breaking ball. Ran out of gas a little bit late with, with you know a couple of home runs and some hard contact in the end there. But all in all, it was a very strong outing from Nesta Cortez. Um, he also made a nice play on the mound. <laughs> and he keeps making good plays out there. And I wouldn't be shocked if Nesta Cortez, if he, um, if he won a gold glove this season. Because he's very, was it Tanaka who was very good in the field? He was He's very Tanaka-esque. He can feel this position very well. Um, but yeah, Nestor's been good. He's, he's flown under the radar this season. But he's off to another very solid start. Through three starts with a 260 ERA. But that was it from the second game. And now we're going to talk about the two wins of the series. As soon as we get back from break, stay with us. We'll be right there. Hey guys, so if you are a listener of the podcast often. And you want to know where to find me on social media. You can find me on Facebook. At BD4. You can find me on Twitter at BD4Pod. And you can also find me on Instagram at Rob J. Carbone. BD4 is located on many different platforms. You can listen to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, 
And if you do there, be sure to give us a five-star rating and review. You can listen to it on Spotify, but you can also watch the podcast on both Spotify and YouTube. BD4 is available on many other platforms as well. All you got to do is search it up. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and much more. All right. Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, RJ Carbone. Let's get right into the third game of the set. <clears throat> I think we talked about the two losses enough. Let's talk about some positives. Uh, the third game of the set went well. The Yankees bounced back on Saturday night with a 6-1 to victory. You had Domingo Herman going up against Tyler Molly. Bottom of the second, Kyle Higashioka, who started a catcher in this game, knocks one out. Home run, 2-0 Yankees. 3-0 Yankees after Rizzo goes deep in the third. Five, uh, four nothing Yankees. Once DJ singled in a run in the fifth. Top of the seventh, Twins get on the board. Miranda doubles. It's four to one. Uh, and then the bottom of the seventh, Stanton doubles in a run to make it six to one. Off the wall there. We'll get to that whole thing in a bit. But the Yankees win on what was uh, Jackie Robinson Day. It's always a day I like to watch. It's it's a it's a great day in baseball. Um. Uh, you know, obviously every team wears the number 42. I was looking at the numbers on this one, and I'm trying to figure out what was different with the 42. Because I don't think they did this in years past, but I think every 42 in Major League Baseball the uh, yesterday was Dodger blue. I like that. It looked. I was trying to figure, was it the font? Was it the old school font or something? I think it was the fact that they made it Dodger blue. That would, It looked pretty cool. Um... But yeah, it's it. Jackie Robinson Day is always fun. Um, MLB the show actually has a certain mode uh, in this year's game. It's a uh, it's a certain mode. It's a game mode on the Negro Leagues, and I've been playing it, and it's awesome stuff. You know, you get to pick your story mode of which African American icon, you know, pioneer from the game, and um, they give you little goals to accomplish throughout each game. It's pretty cool stuff. So, and it's a cool way to teach you know the younger generation of of the history of baseball. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah, it's called Negro Leagues. It's on the main menu right when you load up the game. But um, yeah, it was a good win for the Yankees. The bats bounced back nicely in this game. Six runs on six hits, five walks, nine strikeouts, and um, only one two of ten in scoring position. But everybody on the team picked up a hit with, uh, except for Glaber. Uh, Glaber did draw a walk. Uh, you had Stanton and Higashioka, two RBIs. DJ and Rizzo with an RBI each. Rizzo and Higashioka with a home run. Stanton almost hit one. Uh, two walks for Judge and Volpe. Uh, Volpe stole three bags in this game. I think the bottom of the fifth inning was a great example of why Volpe and DJ uh, basically back-to-back in the order can work very well. Uh, Volpe gets on base. He swipes second base. And your best contact hitter comes to the plate with a runner in score position all of a sudden. So I think if Volpe keeps on getting on, um, keeps on getting, if he keeps getting on base, fucking, and, and DJ keeps hitting well, um, fucking, I almost sneezed and I had a yawn at the same time. That was really weird. Um, you know, if, if he keeps getting on base and DJ keeps hitting well at the top, it's something that could work. But I want to talk about the batting order with those two guys in a little bit. Um, we'll get to that later in the episode. Uh, Domingo Herman was excellent in this game. Much needed. Six and a third innings. One run. Three hits. No walks. 11 strikeouts. Desperately needed this one from Herman. With the way guys have struggled... Outside of Garrett Cole and Nestor Cortez, we needed that. Domingo had looked pretty bad up to yesterday. Um, His first start wasn't great. His next start was pretty horrendous with the walks. Um, I was asking for at least five in this game, and he pitches into the seventh. And he really changed the momentum of the series. He changed the series. Imagine if he threw up another dud. Then you're looking at three consecutive losses there. Some real problems with the staff. The injuries now. Different tone. He changed it. Uh, his stuff looked great. The changeup early on was working. 
You have the two-seam curveball sequence. That was really sharp. It's good to see the curveball look as good as it did in this start because that's his pitch. That's his out pitch. He was getting multiple outs with it, and he threw it very uh, very often. Um, I think he was perfect through what was it, five and a third before he let up consecutive singles, but he didn't let it. You know, he didn't unravel, and he finished with six and a third strong. Uh, he had the whole thing with the rosin. Um, I don't know. I'm not going to get too deep into it. I don't really care. Basically, um, you know, Baldelli was frustrated. Uh, the umpire, I guess what Domingo Herman does now is he uses the rosin before he leaves the dugout every inning. Um, and the umps were saying, no, dude, you got to use the rosin on the, uh, on the mound. And they noticed that his hand was a little sticky. So they asked him to wash his hands. I think he didn't wash it enough the next time he went back out. So it caused the whole thing. But ultimately, it's the ump's call. Um, and so that was really all it was. Baldelli wanted to go by the book there. And, you know, he's got a point. I thought he should have been ejected. But nonetheless, I don't think it was anything more than rosin. I, I don't think it was... You know, illegal substance. Um, the spin rate, they said, was nothing drastic. Uh, yeah. Whatever. That was that was stupid. But I, I was happy to see that. I have, you know, of the three pitchers outside of Cole and Cortez, uh, when you look at Domingo, Schmidt, and Brito, I have most faith in Domingo Herman that he can rebound uh, than, I, than I do the other two. Um, Schmidt, I just don't trust his stuff enough. He can't get lefties out. He can't get guys out the more he faces the, the order. Um, the cutter looks like shit. I think he's better suited for the pen. Johnny Brito, I, you, we just don't know much. Um, but Domingo, you know. You know, he was very solid for the Yankees last season. You know, in the summer there, I remember when Severino went down last year, he came in and he was lights out for a while as a spot starter. Uh, he's also not too far removed from his 18 win campaign, which was, I think, back in 2019. <laughs> he's a dude who won 18 and four for you. So he's a good pitcher, man. He is. I just think when he has one or two bad starts, it might be a little louder because he's not the easiest Yankee to root for. Because you know he's not the greatest human being. I get that, but as a pitcher, you know, emotion aside, as a baseball pitcher. I have faith in him that he could be at least decent. Um, Michael King also pitched in this game, and he was great. So great that I'm going to give Mike King my tip of the cap. Michael King this series, two and two-thirds innings pitched, two hits, no runs, and two strikeouts. Yeah, man, um... You know, looked a little shaky to start off. He lets the inherited runners score there. Some hard contact early on. Uh, the double to Miranda. The base hit issued to Solano. <laughs> There's my sneeze. Um, even on that double play he got, it was a very hard hit ball off the bat of Max Kepler. But then he settled in. He went six up, six down in the eighth and ninth innings. And um, what I liked was that his fastball velocity was up a little bit. That was a very promising sign to see. Um, you know, it, it was more relieving than anything. You know, and I, I just hope he gets hot soon. I need Michael King to go on a big FU streak, kind of like one like Cole's on right now. I need him to just get really hot. Um, like, I know the numbers on the year say he's been hot. Like, if you look at the numbers on the surface... Um, but he's allowed 11 hits in nine and two thirds innings. It's a lot of traffic. Um, he's also allowed three of the inherited runners to score. All three of them have scored uh, this season when he's come into the game. And um, so, you know, he's had some shaky moments. He definitely hasn't looked dominant yet. Uh, but, I, you know, it was an okay step in the right direction on um, on Saturday. Uh, and that's it for Game 3. 
Game 4, which took place this afternoon, also went to the Yankees with the big win behind Garrett Cole. Um, bottom of the third inning, oh, the Yankees went 2-0. Garrett Cole versus Pablo Lopez in a pitcher's duel. Uh, bottom of the third inning, DJ LeMay used singles to right field to score Aaron Judge. Bottom of the sixth inning, DJ LeMay goes to right field for a home run. And it's 2-0 Yankees, and that was really it. Lopez ends up going six. Cole goes the full nine, complete game shutout. The Yankees win. Um, the Yankee bats were quiet again. Two runs, seven hits, two walks, ten strikeouts, one of seven in scoring position. DJ led the team in hits, RBIs, and home runs. Um, another stolen base from Volpe. Judge and Glaber walked. Glaber was on base twice. Um, yeah, not much offense. They were facing Pablo Lopez, who ended up going six innings. Uh, but the Yankees got on base eight times against him, could only muster up two runs. Um, and then nothing versus the pen. But the bats weren't great, but this was a game where the Yankees rode Garrett Cole, who absolutely pitched enough to get my tip of the cap this series. Garrett Cole went nine innings in this game. Complete game shutout. Nine innings, two hits, no runs, one walk, ten strikeouts, and the win. He wins the pitching duel against Pablo Lopez. He was exceptional in an already exceptional first month of the season. He had a no-hitter going through four and two-thirds, I think it was, maybe four and a third. Uh, but somewhere in the fifth inning, he lets up you know, the base hit to left field where Hicks kind of half-asses it to go after it. Um, he's so checked out. Uh, but later in the game, I, I kind of got nervous because maybe it was like the eighth inning where I saw Captain Cuck in position at the top of the dugout there. Um, and then I I got really annoyed when I saw Peralta warming up. I'm like, why would you take him out? He's cruising. And then I got angry when I saw Clay Holmes warming up, I think, in the ninth inning. Um, or the eighth inning, rather. But... Yeah, it, it, unfortunately, Cole was allowed to throw the entire game. He's now 4-0 and on the season. He's allowed no home runs on the year. He's got a 0.95 ERA, knock on wood. Um, he's, he's been great. He's been dominant this year, man. He's been dominant, and I think he's been dominant. We probably mentioned this before, with, with less time to overthink due to that pitch clock. You know, he's just been fastball heavy, attacking with the high heat all day. And really all year outside of his last start where he shook it up. But he's going high fastball a lot. He's working quick. And he's getting outs. Uh, the knuckle curve looks good. It's staying out of the zone. The changeup looks good. That's staying out of the heart of the plate. Uh, the slider's looking good. You know, he still doesn't go to the cutter. <laughs> you know, He kind of eliminated that pitch ever since he added it to his arsenal early last season. But he's been an excellent four-pitch pitcher. He's off to a Cy Young start. And you can make a case he's been the best pitcher in baseball so far in the early on here, at least. Um, yeah, he, he was phenomenal. He's been phenomenal today. He saved the entire bullpen. And with the day off tomorrow now, that's even better. You get to double up there. But Garrett Cole has been nothing short of phenomenal. And again, the most important stat is that he's 4-0. The Yankees are winning on Garrett Cole games. And again, my goal for them this season is to win 70% of his starts. So 100 through 4 is not a bad start. Um, and, um, yeah, that, that's really it for game four of the series. I mean, outside of the first two games or the first game, really outside of the first game, the Yankee pitch, the Yankees pitch really good. They did. Um, and the Yankee pitching this season <laughs> as a whole has been fantastic. It really has. How about this? Despite all the injuries they've had, all the, the shaky bullpen outings from certain guys, the, the the three guys outside of Cole and Cortez who've had ups and downs, outside of that, not outside of it, but even with that, I should say, the Yankee pitching has still been very good. Their rotation is eighth in the RA. Their bullpen is second. Individually, a lot of guys are doing their job. 
Nestor's got a 2.60. Cole's got a 0.95. In the bullpen, Loisaga's got a 2.70. I know he's hurt now, but Hamilton's got a 2.08. King, 1.86. Marinaccio, 1.50. Peralta has got a 0 in his ERA. Abreu, he's got a 0 in his ERA. Honda guys are doing their damn jobs. Sure, you also have you know, two or three other guys we didn't mention there struggling some. And even guys like Mike King and, and Johnny Loisaga have had some iffy moments. But at the end of the day, the Yankees, while some losses this year have been due to bad pitching, you will go. You also got to remember the 10 wins they have on the year are mostly from great pitching. They have a team ERA of just over three, which is fourth in baseball. Their pitching has been good. And it's been good for a few years in a row now. And for some reason, it always just gets this stigma of the Yankees need more pitching. The Yankees need pitching, pitching, pitching. But the pitching has gotten the job done despite what this narrative, despite this narrative for the last couple of years. I don't know. It always seems to be a narrative where the Yankees fans or the media always talk about this team needing pitching. But the pitching's been good. At the end of the day, it's always the bats that go silent. Um... And the bats usually produce in the regular season, and I have faith that they will wake up this season. But the Yankee bats so far, I don't want to say have been a problem, but they've definitely been the weakest part of the two. Um, they're 13th in runs scored, which isn't like them. They're 21st in average, which, you know, that's about right. Uh, but they're 11th in OPS, not like them. Uh, they are third in home runs. So they've been good overall so far, but not as good as they usually are. Um, obviously they're, they're, you know, never going to be a team who hits for average under this regime. Uh, th- this is a regime who runs a different philosophy about the three true outcomes and hit strikes hard and, you know, they, they don't believe in that stuff. Uh, but the power has been there. It's just, they're not scoring an absurd amount of runs yet because I don't think, I don't know. They, I, I think they will eventually. Um, but yeah, the best part of the team has definitely not been the hitting. It's been the pitching. Obviously now with the Stanton injury, that's going to be an even bigger blow to this offense. Um, Stanton went down on Saturday, game three, uh, kind of taking his time out the box there because he, Michael Kay, and probably everyone else thought it was clearly a home run. Um, so when he saw it bounce off the top of the wall, he suddenly had to go from jogging to turning on the jets. And I believe that's kind of when he pulled it, the hamstring. Um, and so here we are again, standing out with another lower body injury. Um, since 2019, he's played in 303 of all possible 562 games. Um, that is barely over half his games. So. I think that's 53% of the games he's played in since 2019. Not good. Um, <laughs> not good. It, it's a sh- it's such a shame. Because I wanted this guy so badly to have a full season this year where he stays healthy and he goes for 40 bombs. Looked like he was on pace to do that. Not going to happen. Because the timeline for this injury... The Yankees said it's four to six weeks. That's Yankee jargon. So in translation, that means six weeks minimum. Let's be real here. So I wouldn't be shocked if it's more eight weeks and we see him in mid-June instead. <laughs> but um, it sucks. It's always, always, always a lower body injury. And those are those linger. Um, and it's weird because the Yankees called up Peraza. But he probably won't see any time, and he's probably going to go back down soon, because Donaldson returns this week against the Angels. I think he's uh, activated either Tuesday or Wednesday. They said, uh, but it's weird to me because Peraza only has four, maybe five options left. So it's like, why waste this option on him if you're not planning on keeping him up here? They they've been doing nothing but treating this kid like garbage, man, since last year, and I'm kind of getting sick of it. And we've talked about it enough. I don't want to go too much deeper into it, but it's annoying. I just I can't stand how they operate, favoring the dinosaur Donaldson. Right, Donaldson always 
He automatically gets the nod because he's the veteran and he's the one making the money. It's it's politics. It's all politics, um, and it's it's not fair. I don't. I can't tell if they play. I don't know what they think of Peraza. It, it doesn't seem like they value him, but I feel like he hasn't. He he. T- I, I said I wouldn't go down this rabbit hole, but he's done nothing but produce. He he came he came up for you. You waited so long last year to bring him up. When he was clear, you needed him earlier than you get. You gave him a chance. He gets the chance in September. He still doesn't play every day, but when he does, he batted over 300 for you. Doesn't really play in the playoffs. Despite him having a good season for you last year at the end there, you rely on spring training stats, who are, which are meaningless, more meaningless than anything, to send him back down to the minors. And now, now, now you're calling him up, kind of cucking him, and you're just going to send him back down. It's, it's frustrating. He, he should be up here with the bigs. Um, so that's an annoying part that Donaldson is going to be right back in the middle of the order. Um, that's going to be boring and, and dreadful to watch. The good parts of this lineup have been pretty fun though. I know judge and Torres have been quiet of late, but how about Anthony Volpe coming alive a little bit? He is, uh, first off, this kid has insane speed and he is super aggressive every time he gets on base. Every time he gets on base. I I love that. What was it? Was it the third game of the set? Uh, he just he ended up stealing three bases. But I like that he was up. The Yankees were up five runs. Late in the game. He takes second base. Very next pitch, he takes third base. I love it. Go for it, kid. Fuck it. Get your steals. I love it. Um, I honestly wouldn't be shocked if Anthony Volpe put up 40 stolen bags this year. I wouldn't. The only thing we'll be getting on base enough to get those 40 stolen bases. Um, but his base running is great. His defense has, has been solid at shortstop. He showed off the arm a little bit this series. But yeah, now he's starting to show a little something at the plate. He's on a modest five-game hit streak with one a day. He's got 313 average during the streak. 421 on base. Three walks, four stolen bases. Now, before the hit streak, Volpe was down to 129 with the average and 444 with the OPS. After the streak, he's got his numbers on the year now up to 191 and 628 OPS. So it's obviously still terrible, but it's much closer to getting off the Schneid than where he was before. If he keeps hitting, and if he eventually gets hot and becomes a weapon, I kind of think Boone and the Yankees see him as the new leadoff guy. I mean, they've been toying with it lately, trying to get a taste of what it's like, and he's been taking advantage of it. You know, he had a double the other day. Um, and it's, it's not something I hate. As much as I love DJ in that leadoff spot, I wouldn't mind batting DJ LeMayu fifth at all and having Volpe one. It's something that's kind of grown on me a little more the more often the Yankees do it. It's also a nice surprise once you get past 2-3-4 in the order. You're like, oh sweet, we still got DJ to go through and it's not you know Calhoun or Cordero or Trevino just yet. It's DJ. And DJ has been hitting well this season, man. You know, he's up to 283 with the average. The OPS is a tick under 900. He's got the 400 average in scoring position this year. The power seems to be back. He's roping the ball hard again to the opposite field. Took that inside fastball today to right field. That was nice to see. He looks good. And the Yankees always look good when DJ looks good. Right? We talk about that a lot. This season, they're 3-0 and when he has a multi-hit game. And they're 7-3 and when he picks up at least one hit. I know it's a very small sample, but I do think there's something to it. When DJ gets on, everybody else seems to feed off it. Which is kind of why I like him at the top of the order. And honestly, if the Yankees weren't so damn stubborn and hell-bent with Judge at the 2, I'd love to see Volpe and DJ interchangeable at 1-2, and two, followed by Judge at 3. But... 
you know, we're, we're talking fantasy baseball here because that's never happening. They're not moving Judge out that spot. They want him to get the most at-bats. But, yeah, uh, DJ LeMayu, Anthony Volpe, continue to play well. Volpe, I, I'm excited for it. If he can get something together and get hot, that's that's huge. Um, it was good to see him get the first home run out of the way. He needed that desperately. Um, also having a, having a good um, stretch at the plate recently is Anthony Rizzo, who I'm giving a tip of the cap to. Anthony Rizzo against the Twins in four games. Very good. Six out of 15 this series. That's 400. Three home runs. I know two of those home runs were in the garbage game, but he did produce throughout the series. Uh, and he's quietly, very quietly, been very, very good for the Yankees this year. And you can make a case that Rizzo has been the Yankees' most consistent, best hitter. Like, he's yet to hit a slump, where I feel like everyone else has hit some kind of slump so far. Judge has seen one. Glaber's kind of going through a bit of a regression period at the moment. Uh, Stanton had a period in the final game of the Cleveland set, and then the first game of this series where he didn't do too much. Um, Oswaldo didn't hit in three of the four games this series. I need him to start hitting for power. I hope it comes. A lot of strikeouts so far from Oswaldo. Not a ton of pop. That's not a good combo. But, yeah, I feel like everybody but Rizzo has kind of had a moment where they haven't hit. I feel like Rizzo, though, has just been quietly doing his thing on a nightly basis. Playing every single night and constantly producing, giving them something each night. The man is a staple in this order, and he's my favorite player for a reason. Other than the fact that he's an Italian-American. Um, no, I, he's been good, man. And I just think he needs to be talked about more. Um, not flashy, but consistently do, doing his thing. He's hitting the ball really hard, too. Uh, and obviously, without the shift, I'm sure that's that's also helped him hit the ball at a, whatever he's hitting, 314 clip or something like that. Um, so, nothing to really complain about. There is one thing I do want to bring up here um, that I think the Yankees eventually need to address take a look at very soon especially with the latest injury to Giancarlo their bench is not very good um, and I feel like they don't know what the hell they're doing with it like I guess it's it's Hicks right now IKF, Calhoun sometimes Franchi and whichever catcher sits that day Hicks is in this weird spot where he's halfway out the door he rarely plays and when he does like today you keep seeing the body language in his at-bats and in the field that he's clearly checked out. IKF has one hit on the season, I believe. He's got no glove. The arm hasn't been impressive. And he's just not doing it for you. Calhoun is, is some random from the scrap heap who the Yankees will eventually cut. Literally just a body to take up roster space in the meantime. He shouldn't be getting at-bats. Um, none of your catchers are giving you much offense. That may eventually have to become a conversation at some point. I know catchers don't bring you offense. They're not supposed to bring you a ton of offense, but there still needs to be some standard here. Um, and then you got Franchi, who I think is starting to come down to earth a little bit from his hot start. But point being, the bench doesn't really have one guy that you see sustaining a long-term go-to skill set. Like, nobody specializes and is elite in one category. You don't have a guy that mashes lefties. You don't have a glove guy. You don't have a guy with blazing speed or any of that. You just have a bunch of misfit randoms who aren't very good at baseball. Um, and I think the Yankees should address the bench in a little bit before it gets too late. Um, I mean, honestly, again, we're talking fantasy world here. Peraza will be perfect to play a little third base. And... I hope they've been working on Peraza at third base in the minors these last, you know, six months. Uh, because he would be perfect to play at third base. And you've got Donaldson coming off the bench, maybe giving you some offensive field power off the bench. Because he did hit 15 home runs last year. You figure maybe he's better suited off in a bench role. Maybe he could be productive there. Um, but yeah, why is he starting? You know, Peraza should honestly, that would be great. We got Peraza at third base. It's risky. Because you got Cabrera, Peraza, and Volpe, three young players who could easily all struggle at once. But 
is it worse than Donaldson? Because who's to say Donaldson's going to suddenly at 37 years old start hitting like he did three years ago, two, three years? Like that's the that that's it's just the bench is a little annoying. The situation with Peraza is a little annoying, but yeah, that no complaints outside that. The Yankees are playing well. Uh, things are solid at the moment. The Angels are next, and the Yankees at 10 and six will head into that series against the Angels, who I think are playing decent so far. But that's it. We'll head to our final break, get to our question of the day, wrap it up from there. Stay with us. Be right back. We also have a website now for BD4. If you go to BD4blog.com, you can find the blog, the podcast links, and also where to find me on social media. Just go to BD4blog.com. Studio 69 Productions is a podcast production agency created by Leo Rodriguez to allow content creators to market their podcast. It's an online platform that will market your podcast or any other project that you're working on. Get in touch with Leo Rodriguez from Studio 69 Productions. You can find Studio 69 Productions on Instagram at Studio69NJ. Studio 69 Productions, where dreams are heard and born. You know, man, I something I've been keeping an eye on very quietly, but I've been checking every night to see how they've been doing. So far, you look at the AL West, the Houston Astros are second to last, they're in fourth place. They're seven and nine. Uh, they're only two and a half games behind the Texas Rangers for first, but they're seven and nine. They lost tonight. I haven't been paying attention to them outside of just looking up at if they're winning or losing. So I don't know what their problem has been. Uh, but obviously they're they're still without Correa. I don't know how Jeremy pa- Jeremy Pena is that the shortstop. I don't know how he's been doing. Uh, I don't know if they've been dealing with uh, the Verlander loss. Poorly. I don't know how their pitching staff has held up. I worded that weird. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm looking at that 7-9 and nine record. I'm looking at their slow start and thinking, man, wouldn't that be something? If we can get the Astros to be, you know, the pre-American League Astros again and just start sucking, or not that bad, but not be an issue, that opens the door for the Yankees. That opens the door a little bit. I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm looking at, I'm, I'm paying, and I think they're going to, you know, I think, uh, what is K called? Market correction will eventually take place, but that's the one fun thing about April. You can overreact and nobody thinks you're crazy. Um, let's get to our trivia, wrap this up. All right. So, for episode 509 here of the podcast, our NYY, NYK, MMA trivia question of the day is, before Garrett Cole, who was the last Yankees pitcher to throw a complete game shutout at Yankee Stadium? Before Garrett Cole, who was the last Yankee pitcher to throw a complete game shutout at Yankee Stadium? All right. So one last time, our trivia question of the day for episode 509. Before Garrett Cole, who was the last Yankees pitcher to throw a complete game shutout at Yankee Stadium? So let me know the answer. If you get it correct, I'll give you a shout out. That's it, fellas. That is all we've got for this episode. Episode 509 is in the books. I'm your host, RJ Carbone. And I will see you. In 510, when we are talking Knicks, because what a win that was. Wow. Oh, I'm excited just thinking about it. We're going to get to the Knicks. Episode 510 should be out the latest, the very latest, by uh, Monday night, April 18th or 17th. Monday, April 17th, which is when this episode will be released. This episode will be released Monday, April 17th in the a.m., and that next episode will be released the latest by late night Monday, April 17th. Hope you enjoy that. So thank you. I hope you enjoy this episode. 509 is in the books. 
And I will see you guys in the next show. Go Yankees. All right. This episode was brought to you by Anchor.